With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics this Thursday evening. Uh, had a little bit of an emergency, and that's why we're getting started a little bit late with the other job. And, and because I had that emergency, wasn't really able to get everything put together today. Uh, just some some stuff that, uh, you know, just like anything else, some, some days are busier than others. And so we're actually going to have a really short show tonight, but I did want to address an issue that I do believe is important, especially to our state since it deals with our Senate race. So thank you so much for being here with us on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. Thank you so much for being with us on the program this evening, and the story that I'm talking about, of course, has to do with Jeff Sessions jumping into the ring. Now, I'm not going to just rehash everything that I've done from the past couple shows about what his entrance into the field does and how it might shake things up and, and who might vote for him or not vote for him. We covered all that on Tuesday's show. If you want to watch that, if that's the reason you're here, go watch Tuesday's show. It gives a very comprehensive view of, of all of that stuff. But tonight we're actually going to look at something else because Jeff Sessions did a campaign ad where he puts on a MAGA hat and talks about how big a Trump supporter he is. So I'm, I'm not even just going to give any straight commentary. I will just uh, let you see the video first and then give you my opinion on what's going on. So here's Jeff Sessions' campaign ad. I am pleased to endorse Donald Trump for the presidency of the United States. You know, out of the 100 United States senators, I was the very first one to stand with Donald Trump. While the others were hiding under their desk, I went to work. I knew he was the one to make America great again. And I'll keep fighting for President Trump and his agenda. I'm Jeff Sessions. I approve this ad. So there you have it, Jeff Sessions' campaign ad. And as you can tell, there's literally nothing in it other than him trying to prove to the voters of Alabama how incredibly pro-Trump he is. And this is something that just absolutely sickens me for a number of reasons. And it's not that I hate Trump or am a never Trumper or anything like that, because you guys know that I have a, uh, I have good days and bad days with Trump, which I think is, is pretty standard for most politicians that you have some things they do. You like some things that they do that you don't. But the reason this really bothers me is it's really, really annoying that we have gotten to a place in this country right now that Essentially, the measure of how worthy you are to represent a group of voters, if you are a Republican nowadays, is how much did you support Trump? And that really bothers me. It really bothers me that we have gotten to the point to where just identifying with the party's leader, and he, he is the leader of the party, he's the president, I'm, I'm not saying that he isn't, but identifying how on board you are with that person and how much you like a certain politician is now the crux of the vast majority of Republicans' campaigns. And what ticks me off about this is, this is blatant, shameless pandering. Because you'll notice in that ad, never talks about a policy decision, never talks about the incredible work he did as attorney general or as a senator, where whether it comes to illegal immigration, enforcing laws when it comes to things that he did with religious freedom, I mean, there's a long laundry list of things that Jeff Sessions could campaign on and should. I mean, a testament to how good a politician is, in my opinion, is how much can they run on the record and so how much of it do they have to do just sort of empty lip service. 
Because if you're a person that can actually run on their record, that should be something that is a compliment to you. Jeff Sessions has the ability to do that. Jeff Sessions is a guy that can show you his resume and say, this is the reason you should vote for me. And he doesn't do that. What he has done is he has basically made the pitch of why he should be the senator is that, well, I'm, I'm pro-Trump. Okay, well, I understand there's some conventional wisdom behind that. After all, President Trump is not only the leader of the Republican Party, but he's incredibly popular in the state of Alabama. He's more popular in Alabama than he is any other state. So I get that. But I think that this is a really bad political miscalculation on his part. And he said today, and this is the reason that I'm bringing this back up, he said that he is going to basically earn Trump's endorsement, that he's going to make Donald Trump endorse him. Okay, first of all, Donald Trump is one of the most unpredictable politicians that there has ever been. Whether you love him or hate him, he's very unpredictable. In fact, the, the fact that he is unpredictable is what makes some people hate him and some people love him. Some people love the fact that they don't know what's going to happen next. That, you know, unlike a lot of the swamp creatures that go through about 10,000 different focus groups before they make a statement, Donald Trump just says whatever crap comes flying out of his head. And let's be honest, that is kind of refreshing. Sometimes it winds up not working out too well, but it is refreshing, and that's part of the reason he comes off as so genuine and authentic. But with that in mind, let's also remember that placing your bets on somebody that's that unpredictable is a massive, massive roll of the dice. And it would be a massive roll of the dice, regardless of who the person was trying to basically put on the mantle and cloak themselves in Trumpism. Now, everything that Jeff Sessions said in that ad is 100% true. He was the very first senator, which, by the way, and I've said this for a very long time, was a massive political gamble that wound up paying off dividends for Jeff Sessions and him getting the attorney general spot. But he put his neck out there and put his political career on the line by endorsing Trump before every other senator did, back at, at a time where there were several other candidates that could have very well been the nominee. Jeff Sessions did stake his own political reputation and very long career, kind of put that on the, uh, uh, put, put that on the roll of the dice and, and ran with it. So yes, Jeff Sessions is a very tro pro-Trump individual, He's somebody that had the president's back both in a, a figurative way and also a literal way. But the reason that I think that this is a bad idea, first of all, like I said, I think it's a real problem that politicians are essentially ignoring policy proposals, ignoring talking about what they actually believe in, and trying to ride the coattails of the president. I think that that's bad for anybody. I'm not saying it's not effective. I'm saying I don't like it. And... Maybe that's just not enough for some people that even though they'd like to stand on principle and actually talk about the issues that are going to affect their decision-making process as senator, that they'd rather avoid it. But here's the reason that politically this is stupid too. It's risky for anybody to put their entire campaign on the approval of one person. That is especially risky when you're Jeff Sessions. Because he doesn't have Trump's endorsement right now. In fact, inside sources have suggested that he'd rather torpedo Sessions and not have him back in the Senate. Of course, he's also said exactly the same thing about Roy Moore, so I'm not really sure who he's going to wind up endorsing or pulling for in this. I imagine that Donald Trump will have something to say on Alabama's Senate election before it comes up. But uh, again, if I had to guess, if you're the, the pro-Trump crowd, they're going to go with Tommy Tuberville. That would be my guess. But in all of this, in all of this, I think the reason Jeff Sessions is making a massive political miscalculation is primarily because the problem he is going to run into is he is seeking the endorsement of a person that is incredibly volatile, incredibly unpredictable, whether you love him or hate him, that's just who Donald Trump is. And because of that, 
he is putting it out there when he knows that Trump is far more likely to have a vendetta against him. Look, when you're trying to convince people, no, 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 I really am friends with the cool kid. I'm cool because I'm friends with this guy. Okay, that may be a winning strategy every now and then, but not when there's a really good chance that that guy is going to come up to you and go, no, this guy isn't my friend. And Trump could do that, and if he does that, and if Jeff Sessions makes the centerpiece of his campaign, hey guys, look how pro-Trump I am. Well then, Donald Trump can destroy his campaign like that. All Donald Trump has to say is, I don't want Jeff Sessions in the Senate. Okay, he's done. He has absolutely no hope left. Now, if Jeff Sessions started running on his record and ran on the things that he's done as a senator, ran on his voting record as well as the other things that he's done, the, the bills that he co-sponsored, and starts running on the things that he did as attorney general, okay, well, you've got something there even if Trump doesn't endorse you. But if you're making pro-Trumpism, the, the announcement of your campaign is you wearing a MAGA hat and talking about how pro-Trump you are and making that the focus of your campaign and saying to everybody, no, no, guys, look, it's okay to vote for me. Look how pro-Trump I am. Well, then Trump can destroy you with the, the blink of an eye. Your campaign will be done if he doesn't endorse you. Now, maybe Jeff Sessions knows that, and he sees Trump's endorsement as the only way that he can win anyway, and because of that, he decided to ante up and, and put all of his chips on one hand. I think that's dumb, but that may be something that his team actually talked about and decided to, to do that. I think that's a, a completely stupid idea, frankly. But when it comes to Trump, him being just as likely to torpedo you as opposed to endorsing you, if you were going to put all your money on that anyway, it would have been better for you to not get in the race. I just do not see President Trump endorsing Jeff Sessions. Because, again, love him or hate him, this is not a pro-Trump or an anti-Trump segment. I'm just making observations about what I know about the man. Trump is not exactly known for his forgiving nature. He's not a person that typically just buries the hatchet with people. He tends to let grudges go on for a long time. I mean, he still occasionally talks about Hillary Clinton. Now, granted, part of that is because Hillary Clinton won't freaking shut up. But, but nonetheless, this is a guy who occasionally still talks about Clinton. He'll still occasionally bring up some of his Republican primary opponents. I mean, the man for like, I don't know, 12 years kept sending pictures of his hands to a journalist that said that his hands were too small. I mean, this is a guy that holds a grudge forever. And yeah, I 100% believe that that slight from Jeff Sessions was completely perceived. It's not reality. Jeff Sessions really did stick up for Trump and frankly, probably saved his presidency. If you're looking at the Mueller investigation, the reason that they were not able to get him on obstruction of justice was because of Jeff Sessions. Jeff Sessions may be the reason that Donald Trump is still in the White House right now, but regardless of whether that's true or not, Donald Trump doesn't perceive it as true. He perceives Jeff Sessions and, and what he did with recusal as actually hurting him, and because of that, he's going to behave as though that is the truth. He is going to continue to hold this grudge against him. And because Donald Trump is also not known for keeping his mouth shut on things that he has an opinion on, it's not just that he's going to be against Jeff Sessions, he's going to be vocal about it if this topic comes up. Whether it's, it, whether it's Trump tweeting or Trump getting a, a question about Jeff Sessions from the media or just, you know, because it's a Tuesday, Donald Trump decides he wants to talk about the Alabama Senate race. The president has all kinds of options to tell people, don't vote for Jeff Sessions, and if he does, I don't see Jeff Sessions being able to back out of that if he makes this the centerpiece, the focus of his campaign. I just do not see that happening. And so, from a practical standpoint, this is a really dumb idea. I understand that they're thinking, well, Trump's super popular in Alabama, we need to show how pro-Trump we are. And look, I think that Jeff Sessions can make the case to somebody that's really engaged and paying attention, somebody that watches this show, for instance, and has actually seen my arguments as to why the things that Jeff Sessions were doing actually really helped the president. 
but the average voter just does not pay that much attention to understand the nuance in that. And because of this, if he continues down this this line of attack, this uh, basically this route that he has chosen to take his campaign on, I'm sorry, Senator Sessions, I, I like you, you're a nice guy, but you're basically ensuring Tommy Tuberville is going to win this thing. And remember, like I said, I actually am not trying to pick between the two. I would vote for Senator Sessions over Doug Jones for sure. But the horse that I'm backing in this race, at least for now, is John Merrill. So whether or not Tommy Tuberville or Jeff Sessions duke it out, I don't really have a stake in that right now. I'd, I'd rather have Sessions for sure. But the point is, I'm not saying this because I hate Jeff Sessions or I, I want his campaign to flop or because I want it to succeed. I'm just saying this is how I see it. And there might be a better explanation out there, and there may be some kind of 8D chess that Jeff Sessions people are pe playing behind the scenes, but I highly doubt it. I just do not see this working out well for Jeff Sessions. Now, another thing that I'll talk about uh, that, of course, is affecting the Yellowhammer State, the uh, Porch Band of Creek Indians. They have proposed a compact. So before I say anything further on this particular subject, I would like to point out that I actually do favor a compact of some kind. So when you hear me being critical of it, I'm not doing so because I think that a compact is the worst thing that has ever happened. That's, that's not my stance at all. But there are some things that I think do need serious addressing in this compact before the state of Alabama is to pass it, or it, it would be a good idea for the state of Alabama to pass it. So, um, frankly, this thing's a nightmare. There's not a, a gentler way to put it. I think that we should have some kind of compact, and we should have some kind of regulatory power, and in exchange, we should be getting some tax dollars. But this compact that has been drawn up by the Porch Band of Creek Indians... This thing is not a good deal for Alabama. And I'll explain why. First of all, it open up it opens up their facilities, in other words, the the Porch uh, Creek Indians. It opens up their facilities to class 3 style gaming. Now, for those of you who don't understand the classification system and granted I'm not an expert on it, but essentially what class 3 gaming is is that is full on casino style tabletop games. I don't believe it's quite the level of Vegas like I think Vegas is class 4 if I'm not mistaken. But what this would do is it would open up the Porch Creek Indian facilities to tabletop blackjack uh you, you know basically all the the casino games. I think it would open it up to like poker and a lot of other high high stakes tabletop gaming. So this is what they're really wanting. They're wanting, you know, slot machines and everything else. So this opens up the floodgates to full-on casino gaming. And, of course, that's that's what the Porch Creek Indians want. But the real sticker, and, and to me the thing that is even a bigger deal, because the Class 3 gaming, I don't see that as big a deal as this. This, to me, is the thing that just automatically, if, it were, if this were the only thing in the compact, I'd say, uh, nope. This alone would cause me to oppose it. They get exclusive gaming rights. In other words, what this would do is give the Porch Creek Indians the only rights to set up gambling facilities in the state of Alabama. That's absurd. Because that would essentially be a state-sanctioned monopoly. I don't know about how the organization works itself. I mean, like maybe the Porch Creek Indians could split itself into two and still have competition that way. But basically anything short of that, this is a state sanctioned monopoly. And if we are going to have the state with gambling inside of it, it makes perfect sense to me to allow other citizens that are not part of the Porch Creek Indians to be able to compete. Now, I have no desire to gamble, and frankly, if given the option, I'd rather it not even be around. If you're just, you know, asking what Caleb's opinion is and what things Caleb ought to do, I would say that 
Um, if you're asking Caleb's opinion, I would say, let's just not have it all together. But that's not what we're talking about here. And, and we're not just dealing with what's best for me. We're dealing with what's best for everybody. And, and you guys know that I tend to have a pretty libertarian streak, which is the lens that I'm seeing this through. And if we're going to have any kind of gambling, I don't really see class three gambling as, as much worse than class two. And I also don't think that I understand the argument and am sympathetic to the argument that the state should not be regulating what a person spends his own hard earned money on, even if it's something stupid like gambling. I get that argument. But now you're telling me that we need to have gambling and we should have one group of people that are in charge of all the gambling. Um, no. Because not only is that going to make it more difficult for us to regulate it, because if you've only got one group of people to deal with, then they're going to have a lot easier time setting the prices, setting the odds. Just like any other business, when you have a monopoly, you have much more control. In fact, you have exclusive control over the marketplace. And so because of that, this thing would be a really, really terrible idea. And another thing that this compact does is it opens up sports gambling and lotteries. So in other words, you could go to one of these casinos. You could bet on a game. If you're there to watch an NFL game, you could place some bets. And then, you know, the outcome of the game, you, you get your winnings or you lose your money or, or however you come out on that. You have full-on sports gambling and you also have a lottery that is also run by them. So basically, they're wanting to be the monopoly, the cartel. Well, actually, cartel isn't even correct because cartel in, would imply that there's more than one group. They want to be basically the dictators over all gambling in the state of Alabama. This is a horrible idea, giving any one person that much power, whether it was over gambling or whether it was over something completely uncontroversial. If you gave somebody a monopoly, for example, on candy bars in the state, that would be a horrible idea, as benign as that would be. And you're telling me that now, with something like gambling, we should have just one group that runs the whole thing and they are legally protected from competition? Uh, no thanks. This would be a nightmare for the state of Alabama. And here's where the bait comes in. This is what they're trying to use to get people in the state of Alabama on board with this. First of all, they're saying that the state will get $1 billion in tax revenue. They're saying it'll be about $725 million for licensing fees and about $350 million on, on just regular taxes with the gaming itself. And so the state of Alabama will get a $1 billion. Here's the thing. First of all, let's just say that this is 100% accurate. Let's just say that there's nothing wrong with these stats that Alabama actually is going to get a $1 billion. Here's where the uh, being a, you know studying economics comes in handy. Where's that billion dollars going to come from? Because they would not be proposing this and they would not be so gung-ho about it if they didn't believe that they were going to make more than a billion dollars. In fact, if they didn't believe that this was going to increase their profits by more than they already make, they would not want to increase it by a billion dollars. They would not want to increase it to where they would be paying a billion dollars in taxes. Which means what? If they believe that they are going to increase their profits by a substantial amount that would justify them giving a billion dollars a year to the state in the form of taxes, then they must believe that making this into law is going to be worth it in the end. They're going to make more money than this. Now, I have no problem with people making money. I'm a, a big C capitalist. But the reason that this is so super, super sketchy is because if they're willing to do this, then that means they believe having a monopoly over the gambling in this state will net them much more than a billion dollars. And where would that money come from? the citizens of the state of Alabama. They're not going to eat that cost. That money has to come from somewhere. And it's going to come from the people of the state of Alabama. And here's the reason that I, 
I have some misgivings about gambling, and this has been proven in study after study over and over again when they bring it into communities. Gambling doesn't typically affect the richest, most affluent members of a society. It affects the poorest. It most adversely affects the poorest members in a society. It's basically a poor tax. And I'm not somebody that believes that you ought to be taxing the the mess out of rich people just because they're rich, but I also really don't believe that we should be taxing people because they're poor. It's basically a stupid tax. And what that is going to do to our poorer communities will be detrimental. You look at the areas around gambling casinos nationwide, not just in the state of Alabama, you'll notice that what happens in those communities is the area surrounding the community looks really bad and the casino itself is very nice and pristine. See, the reason that that takes place is because gambling, like anything else, is uh, like, like other forms of addiction, controls a person's life to where they start spending all of their money on it, and the house always wins. Again, if you want to make a libertarian argument that people ought to be able to spend their money on what they want to, I hear you. I do. But giving that kind of power to a single group exclusively and to allow them to come into these communities and the fact that they're going to be saying, hey, you're going to be getting this billion dollars. Yeah, well, that's a billion dollars that could have been spent in the economy another way. And every dollar that goes to taxes is another dollar that is taken out of the regular economy. Now, it may be going through a casino to do so, just like the gas tax is going through a gas station, a gas company, to get that money taken up. But the point is, it's still money out of the pocket of the citizen. It's still coming out of your pocket. Because governments don't create things, therefore, if they're getting money, they're getting it from you. So when the Porch Creek of Band Indi uh, the, the Porch Band of Creek Indians is saying, "Hey, this is going to create a billion more dollars," even if you agree with that synopsis, and I don't think that it's quite that cut and dry for a number of reasons, even when they make that observation, you have to keep in mind, well, that means there's going to be a billion dollars less in the private sector. That's all that means. So no, I do not approve of this plan. I do not think that this is a good idea. This thing is going to be detrimental to the state of Alabama if we allow for this thing to go through. Here's the thing. Even if you want full-on gambling, even if you're in favor of gambling, whether you're just a libertarian and you don't gamble yourself, but you think people ought to have the right to do it, or you actually want the full-on casino-style gambling, even if you think it's a good idea, this compact is not the way to do it. This thing will cause all kinds of problems within the state. And it will be draining our money to do so, and it will make a handful of people in the Porch Creek Indians super wealthy by doing so because they will have a monopoly and a stranglehold on the gambling industry. And in a roundabout way, a stranglehold on the poor communities in this state. I do not believe that this is a wise decision. If we are going to do this, if we are going to move to full-on casino-style gaming in the state, I'm at least open to hearing the proposal, but we've got to do it right. This is not the right way to do it. All right, so like I said, this is going to be a shorter episode because we got started so late. I had some things I had to deal with with my other job. So uh, because of that, we are going to have to go ahead and sign off here, but, but, I am going to be on tomorrow. We're going to do a, a special Friday show since we had a little less content over the week. So uh, I will see you again here tomorrow. In the meantime, stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.